Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome uh, to a beautiful London morning. It's kind of rainy, and this is just to make you feel comfortable. Um, uh, Foreign Minister, we just want to give you the best brain we possibly had, you know, make you feel in part, of the, part of the town. Welcome to everybody. We're delighted to have you here. This is a, an important opportunity for us. Um, the Right Honorable James Cleveland is here to talk with our government, uh, and he's uh, here to tell us how important Ukraine is. I know I've seen from some of the some of the advanced press articles about that, but I'm sure we'll have a larger conversation than that as well. He's a distinguished public service. He's a politician and he's a military man. And I, I think both of them should be honored in equal proportion. He, he served in many different positions, of course now being the, being the Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, for Commonwealth and Development Affairs. Uh, and, but he previously was the Minister for Education in, in the UK and has served numerous very senior roles in political life in the Conservative Party. Um, but I'd also like to highlight that he dedicated his life as well as a military officer. And he joined the Territorial Army as a young man and he's remained active. And it's a, that's also important because I think it brings a perspective that a lot of uh, foreign ministers don't have, and that's the tangible reality on the ground. So he speaks with an authority that will be uh, very valuable for all of us today. So I'm very grateful, and Kylie, I'm delighted to have you here. We're going to make this, I think, a conversation this morning. Uh, and so uh, with, with your very enthusiastic applause, would you please welcome to the stage the Right Honorable James Cleverly, and, uh, who is the secretary, and also uh, Kylie uh, Atwood. Please join us here, and we'll get this started. Thank you. Well, everyone can hear me fine? Yeah, great. Um, what a pleasure. And to be one of your first stops, I know CSIS is delighted to have you, um, and I'm delighted to be here. So I think uh, because we're in Washington and people really like to dive right in, I think that's exactly what we should do. Do you have anything you want to say before we kind of just start a dialogue here? Yeah, well, I'm just uh, going to say a few, uh, a few words. Firstly, thank you. Thank you, as always for uh, welcoming me. It's, it's lovely being a Brit here uh, in Washington. You always feel very much uh, at home. Um, and I've always been made to feel very, very welcome when I've visited the United States. Um, last year, I made a conscious decision to break out of the, uh, the narrow strips down the edges uh, of the US. And I went to uh, Missouri. Uh, and I went to Fulton, Missouri. Uh, some of you may know that uh, as, the, as the place where Winston Churchill made his famous uh, Iron Curtain speech. Um, and there's a museum dedicated to him there. And I made a speech there, which didn't get quite as much pickup as the, uh, the speech that Winston Churchill made. Um, but I'm reminded of, uh, of uh, his advice to his cabinet as he left office for the final time as prime minister, which was, you know, stay close to the Americans. Um, and I've always believed that the world is a, a safer, healthier, more prosperous place when the UK and the US work closely together. Uh, and I think we're seeing that played out sadly now uh, because of the situation in Ukraine. The United States of America is the largest uh, financial and military donor to the Ukrainians. It is because of the work that the United States um, is doing supporting the Ukrainians that they've been able to defend themselves as uh, fantastically as they have done against Russian uh, aggression. Uh, we're very proud of the fact that the, the UK is the second largest uh, military donor, um, and we will continue working very, very closely with the US in terms of training Ukrainian troops, making sure that they've got the, the modern equipment. We've just announced a whole load of main battle tanks and heavy artillery, hundreds of thousands of rounds of artillery, millions of rounds of small arms am ammunition. Um, and we do that very, very closely coordinated with the United States of America and, of course, other allies around the world. Um, and it's a real reminder that when there is a threat to 
peace and stability and territorial integrity and the UN Charter, the unsurprisingly, but very pleasingly, the UK and the US pull closely together um, and protect the things that we both value. So uh, look, I'm, I'm here to continue that coordination with the US government. I'll be meeting my opposite number, Tony Blinken, later on uh, today and some other people in the administration um, and to continue to make sure that our close working relationship is as close as ever, is, a, uh, uh, is as effective as ever. And I'm very happy to be here to be grilled by, by you. Great. That last bit is not true. I'm, uh, <laughs> no, I am. I'm very, very, very happy. Wonderful. Um, so you mentioned the tanks and big news over the weekend mm -hmm. with the UK government saying that you guys are moving ahead to provide these tanks to Ukraine. I wonder if you can take us inside that decision making a little bit. What was the tipping point? Because the Ukrainians have obviously been asking for these tanks for a long time. So why now and when are they going to get there and what impact do you see them having on the battlefield? Well, look, we, we have always worked very, very closely with the, uh, the Ukrainians uh, and of course our, our NATO allies and, and the US in terms of assessing what the Ukrainians need at various stages of this conflict. Uh, quite famously in the early days of the conflict when uh, Kyiv and other uh, cities were uh, being attacked by Russian tanks, they needed anti-tank um, missile systems, you know, javelins, end laws, and they were game changers. As the uh, conflict evolved, as the air threat increased, uh, air defense missile systems, both ground to air and air to air, became the thing they needed the most. And then, of course, um, financial support and uh, the equipment to repair their energy infrastructure. Uh, and now what we recognize they need is the ability to push back hard in the east uh, and, the, and the south. And the reason that we've decided to uh, intensify our support including those you know, very, very modern uh, NATO standard bits of heavy equipment, tanks, heavy artillery, um, uh, other armored vehicles, and know the US providing Bradleys and um, you know, NATO allies will be making decisions about what other equipment that they will be supplying and, 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 and using to support the Ukrainians. It's because we need to send a really clear message. And the message we're sending to Putin and frankly anyone else that cares to be watching is that we made a commitment to support the Ukrainians until they were victorious. This is what they need to get the job done. This is what we're gonna supply, and we're gonna supply modern, heavy military equipment and the ammunition to allow them to defend themselves properly. And what Putin should understand is we are gonna have the strategic endurance to stick with them until the job is done. And the best thing that he can do to preserve the lives of his own troops is to recognize that we're going to stick with the Ukrainians until they are victorious and bring this war to a conclusion and get around the negotiating table in good faith and not, the, uh, you know, not these kind of performative things that he's been doing up until now. Because that will save lives and, frankly, it will save money. Um, and so we want, to, we want to make sure Ukraine is victorious. We want to make sure that they are successful sooner rather than later. One thing that you wrote over the weekend in an op-ed um, was that the Russian army is on the defensive. You talked about the bad morale within the army, their you know, low stocks when it comes to precision uh, munitions and you know, weaponry. And you said that now is the time to seize the moment, essentially saying the UK, the US, and Western allies shouldn't hold back. How long do you guys have to seize that moment before a potential Russian offensive in the spring? Well, if, if you listen to what Putin says, um, and sometimes we're not as good at listening as we perhaps should be, but you know, he, he keeps making reference to Russia's military history, to, to the kind of uh, poetic narrative of Russia's military past. And he talks about the stoicism of the Russians. He talks about their ability to, uh, to endure privations for longer. They can, they can endure hardship for longer. He's clearly making the case that he wants to drag this conflict out. He wants to make it a slow, attritional conflict. He wants to keep feeding young men and women into the meat grinder. His, 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 his lack of respect for human life is uh, shocking. But he's told us that's what he wants to do. 
And if that's what he wants to do, we should want to do the opposite. We should want to uh, ensure that uh, you know, we, we can see from the actions that he's taking. So uh, until recently, his attacks on civilian infrastructure have been done with cruise missiles. He's now using ballistic missiles to do the same thing, much, much, much more expensive. And he's doing it clearly because he's running low on stocks of other munitions. So this is the time, if we, if we want to bring this to a successful conclusion, and of course we should and we do, we should look to bring it to a conclusion quickly. The conclusion has to be a Ukrainian victory, and that dictates, therefore, that we need to intensify our support at this point in time, whilst Russia has been on the back foot, to give the Ukrainians the tools they need to get the job done. And that's been the driving force between our, uh, behind our thinking. Uh, and that's the conversation that we'll be having to coordinate our actions with our friends and allies, both here in North America and across um, uh, the, the, rest of the, the rest of the NATO uh, alliance. Yeah, but seizing this moment right now, it, it is a unique moment in this, in this war. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the UK expects in terms of, you know, a potential additional Russian mobilization of forces or offensives that could start in the spring? What are you guys anticipating, you know, the next few months to really look like here? Well, look, I'm, I'm going to have to beg your forgiveness because I'm not going to go too uh, much into detail about our um, uh, assessment of, of, of Russia's military thinking, but there are certain things that we know have to happen. If Ukraine is going to be successful, and as I say, that is very much the, the, uh, the end point that we have defined, uh, Ukrainian success in this uh, endeavor. In order for that to happen, we know that Vladimir Putin uh, and the Russian military will need to be on the back foot. We know that will inevitably mean that they'll start using much more escalatory rhetoric. We know that means that they will talk about further mobilizations. We know that means they will talk about, you know, perhaps trying to expand the scope of the conflict. We know that these are things that they will inevitably do as, as they feel under increased uh, military pressure and indeed diplomatic pressure on the world stage. We know these things are going to be the case. We, we should get ready for, for when those things happen. We shouldn't be, we shouldn't allow ourselves to be put off or distracted or, or demoralized because what we are doing, the importance of what we're doing transcends Ukraine uh, in itself. We're defending the UN Charter. We're defending the rule of law. We're defending territorial integrity. We are defending the concept that the powerful cannot just do what they like on the world stage without consequences. This is what's at stake. And those are things that are, are absolutely essential for us both, well, us all to defend. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing that um, we've watched play out over the course of what's been almost a year now is uh, the ramping up of military support that the US and the UK and NATO allies have provided. Obviously, you know, the tanks weren't something that the UK was considering providing uh, during March of last year. So can you um, shine some light onto conversations that you're going to have with US officials this week about what more you can provide even beyond the major announcement this weekend? You know, will you guys discuss cluster munitions, fighter jets, long-range missiles, are those even part of the discussion as a possibility to provide to Ukraine? Well, I, I'm not going to speculate as to what the nature of future military support uh, would be. As I say, our support has evolved as the battle has uh, evolved and as the requirements of the Ukrainians have uh, evolved. Um, look, and it's important to make the point that the United States of America um, is and has been uh, pretty much throughout this conflict the single largest uh, supporter and donor to uh, Ukraine's uh, self-defense. Um, and I think, you know, you know, you should be very proud of your own country for, for doing that. Um, we're very proud to uh, regard you as, as close friends and allies. And of course, the conversations that we have, um, you know, we have very, very close coordination at the, um, uh, you know, the State Department to, um, you know, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office level between myself and uh, Secretary Blinken, uh, between our Ministry of Defense and your own Department of Defense. Um, 
obviously, famously, our intelligence services work very, very closely together. They share intelligence information. It is one of the most integrated partnerships on the world stage. Um, and, we're, you know, and, and that has made a positive difference. And it keeps us safe. Because and, and a, a really, really key for American citizens who will, of course, be looking with interest at the commitments that, that the government is making. This is about keeping them safe. This is not just about Ukraine defending itself. This is about defending the principles that have maintained a significant degree of peace and stability since the end of the Second World War. And that benefits us in the UK, benefits people in Europe, but it also benefits people here in the United States of America. Because if that framework falls apart, the world becomes a much more dangerous, chaotic, and expensive place. Uh, and so it's in all our interests, including people you know, in Fulton, Missouri, uh, to make sure that uh, we, we bring this to a, a speedy and successful conclusion by supporting the Ukrainians. Yeah, and I mean, I understand that you don't want to um, talk about specific additional weaponry that could be provided, but could you say that it's in the realm of the possibility that weaponry and military support to Ukraine that hasn't been provided yet could be provided down the line? Well, look, I... I mean, you're very good. You're, 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 you know, you push me slightly out of my comfort zone, which is uh, exactly what you're here to do. Um, and look, uh, as you say, this time last year, or, or, or after the initial uh, Russian aggression into Ukraine last year, um, we weren't talking about tanks. And we weren't talking about heavy artillery. Exactly my point. Um, and as I say, so our support has evolved. And it is inevitable that it will continue to uh, evolve. Now, there may well be some very informed uh, uh, you know, speculation or debate about what the next stage of our support may be. I'm not going to amplify um, that speculation, but the point is that we do need to ensure that we support the Ukrainians, that we have that, uh, that strategic endurance, that we demonstrate to Putin that we are willing to stick with it, that we've got that grit, that we've got that determination. Because if we don't, the message that we're sending to the, to the world and to every potential aggressor around the world is that you know, if you're willing to stick with it for you know, a little bit longer than us, you will ultimately be victorious. And that would make the world a far more dangerous place. And that's why, uh, from the UK's point of view, and I know this is echoed in capital cities um, uh, uh, across our friends and allies, that we need to send the, the wider message mm -hmm. that when we say something, we mean it and we stick with it. Yeah, and you, I mean, I do think we have seen Putin dig in. And it's very clear that, as you say, you know, he's not, he, there's no signal that he's backing down here. Um, I, was, I was looking and trying to figure out historically how long a conflict like this might last. And CSIS actually did a study right after the war broke out last year, and it found that when interstate wars last longer than a year, they extend over a decade on average, and then they result in sporadic clashes. So we're hitting that year mark right now. Yes Are and no. Are you worried about it extending over a decade? Is the UK committed to providing support to a war that could last for over a decade? So we gotta remember that the stuff we're seeing now is an escalation of a conflict that has actually been happening for many, many years uh, already. Crimea. Uh, the annexation of the Crimea. Um, I mean, this, this, this was uh, 2014. So this, mm -hmm. is, this has been happening for a long while already. Um, and we better make sure that this is the final phase. And, and, and look, there are voices to say, look, we've spent a lot of money, we're donating a lot of military equipment, there's a lot of stuff domestically that I want my government to be thinking about. You know, we hear that in the UK, I'm sure that, that there are voices here in the US, in fact, I know there are voices in the US that are saying the same thing. The point I would make is that um, we all want to bring this to a conclusion. We want to bring this to a successful conclusion, peaceful conclusion. But if we don't do it properly, it ain't finished. And it will come back at us. And, we, and it will cost more lives. Mm -hmm. And it will cost more money. And it will drag on. And that is in no one's interest. So, uh, you know, we made a commitment to the Ukrainians. We've got to make good on that commitment. 
uh, not just for their benefit, but because there is a big chunk of self-interest in that, keeping the world uh, um, uh, you know, peaceful, calm, predictable, uh, and stable. Um, but this war's been dragging on for a long time already. Mm -hmm. And now is the time to bring it to a conclusion. Realistically, when do you think it could be brought to a conclusion? Uh, look, that's, 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 um, that's very difficult for any of us to say. We, you know, we, we are Possibly by the end of this year, or is that probably not in the cards? Well, I mean, uh, I think it was, uh, I can't remember which book it was, Hemingway's uh, famous quote, you know, uh, two characters in the Hemingway book. I can't remember which characters or which book, so probably a bit of a bad <laughs> anecdote. Um, but that famous line, you know, how did you go bankrupt? You know, slowly at first, then quickly. Right. Um, and the point is that, that, that it's very, very difficult to speculate or guess you know, the, the, the next phases of this, uh, of this conflict. But it's in no one's interest for this to be a long, drawn-out, attritional war. I mean, we're seeing terrible images of civilian infrastructure, residential buildings being hit by missiles, mm -hmm. you know, women, children being killed, bodies being taken out of collapsed buildings. We cannot, we cannot allow that to go on any longer than is absolutely necessary. And as I say, it will cost so much more in human lives and so much more in money if we allow this to be a long, drawn-out, attritional war. Um, and it will cost the lives of Russian soldiers as well. I mean, their, their, their body bags going back from the front to Russia as well as Ukrainians. Um, so the moral imperative is, is, is to bring this to a conclusion. As, as, as you know, you've, you've hinted at in a number of your questions, you know, Vladimir Putin has been driven by a, uh, an ambition completely out of kilter with the reality of the situation on the ground. We put intelligence in the public domain um, prior to the conflict that he had hoped to sweep through Ukraine, install a puppet leader in Kyiv and have this whole country under uh, his proxy uh, uh, command within a matter of weeks. And yet what we see is a year later, the Ukrainians have not only defended themselves, but they've been pushing the, the Russian forces uh, back. And Putin should realize that his ambitions will not be realized. We will not let him realize his ambitions. Yeah. And this is why, I, and I keep repeating this, it's, 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 it's the best moral thing to do mm -hmm. to bring this to a conclusion. Quick question before I want to move to, to NATO and its role in all of this, but um, do, you, uh, do you expect that upon reflection, there, you might say that as you guys were releasing all that intelligence about what Russia was planning, it would have been better to also simultaneously re provide weaponry to Ukraine at that time? Well, um Got to remember that, that, that we've been, uh, you know, we were supplying both equipment and training prior to the, to, to the land uh, invasion. We had hoped to uh, deter that invasion through publicizing uh, the, the plans ahead of time. And that was quite a gutsy move to release um, intelligence into the public domain. But we wanted to, to send the message to the world that we, and indeed the message to Vladimir Putin, that we knew what he was planning. Uh, that we were not going to allow him to get away with it. That was very much a message that, 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 we, were, that we were broadcasting. Um, as I say, uh, you know, his ambition um, meant that he went ahead anyway. He was unsuccessful in his um, objectives. Um, he's being pushed back on a number of, uh, in a number of areas. Um, and you know, his best chance, oh, that was me. Um, his best chance of being successful uh, evaporated spring of last year. So from here on in, the, uh, the outcome, I mean, my contention is the outcome is inevitable, which is going to be a, a Ukrainian success. So the only question he has in his mind is, is how many lives is he going to waste pursuing what is a, an unachievable goal for him now. Yeah. I think so many people would look at the Ukraine war and say that it has rejuvenated NATO. It has given, given NATO a new sense of necessity and purpose. How would you reflect upon that? 
Well, funnily enough, I was at, um, I was at the NATO-Russia summit at the early part of last year before the invasion um, had started. Senior uh, Russian military representatives were uh, sat around the, uh, the table. Um, and obviously there was a lot of talk and speculation about the Russian military build-up, the chances of a Russian military attack. And when representative after representative, including you guys and us, you know, we're the, we're the two largest contributor nations to, to NATO, but also some of the newest and economically and militarily smallest NATO allies all spoke with one voice in the condemnation of the military build-up and making it absolutely clear that we would stand firm uh, against this kind of aggression. You could see the shock on the faces of the uh, Russian military. It was quite clear that Vladimir Putin thought that putting pressure on NATO would fragment NATO, that there would be arguments, that the uh, North American allies, yourselves and Canada, would be split off from the European allies, that you know, Southern or Western Europe would have a very different appetite to the Eastern European allies. And yet what we saw was a real unanim unanimity of voice NATO really, really pulled together. Um, and I know, because you can see it on the faces of the people in the room, that was not what they were expecting. And NATO has proven itself to be a really important alliance, which is why we're seeing Sweden and Finland now um, uh, change decades of uh, um, political posture and apply to uh, join NATO, because NATO has shown itself to be relevant. Because NATO has shown itself to be relevant, do you think that now would be a good time to entertain ideas and conversations about increasing spending among those who are members of NATO above that 2%? Well, one of the, one of the things we've seen is that um, you know, a number of countries have unilaterally decided to significantly increase their uh, defense spending. I mean, Germany, for example, just at the beginning of the year, I had a bilateral meeting with, my, uh, with Annalena Baerbock, my, uh, my German opposite number. Um, and last year, Germany made a really big decision to very significantly increase its uh, defense spending, uh, changing decades of uh, defense and foreign policy as a direct result of Russia's attempted invasion of Ukraine. Uh, and we see in other NATO allies uh, an increased commitment on uh, defense spending. Um, and actually, you know, NATO has been talking about how it uh, makes itself relevant for the 21st century. Obviously, it was born out of the conflict of the mid 20th century, but it needs and wants to be uh, relevant to all the contemporary and future threats. Those conversations happened prior to Russia's attempted invasion of Ukraine. Um, and those conversations will continue. So NATO is modernizing. Uh, member states are increasing their expenditure. Um, we, of course, are, are, are looking at what lessons we can collectively learn from uh, Russia's attack onto Ukraine and Ukraine's defense uh, against it. Um, and of course, there is this uh, now this uh, you know two new member states who are going through the process of joining NATO as we speak. Uh, so um, this, of course, has been a tipping point uh, for NATO. Putin has tested the alliance, and I'm very, very pleased and proud to say the alliance has actually come out stronger. So it sounds like you don't think right now is the, is the moment to try and pressure those who aren't meeting the 2% to go be, even beyond that. Well, look, we, we are two countries who have, um, you know, uh, consistently committed to above that 2%. The 2% is uh, the, uh, the NATO spending target. And of course, we have and we will encourage um, uh, NATO member states to uh, match that commitment. There is a very real tangible example of why that is so very, very important. And as I say, you know, I'd rather, uh, I'd rather, um, you know, congratulate and encourage rather than conjole, uh, cajole or, or criticize. Um, but we, we want to lead by example. I know the US very much does that. The UK does that as well. We want to demonstrate why it is in our own self-interest to match uh, those spending uh, commitments, yeah. and we will continue to have those conversations across the alliance. Yeah. And just because you mentioned Germany, <clears throat> I think people are um, watching with bated breath to see what Germany does on its decision over tanks. Uh, your counterpart, Defense Secretary Ben Wallace, was 
pretty clear uh, in his remarks yesterday saying that he encourages Germany to, to go ahead and green light these tanks or at least allowing other countries to send um, German tanks like Poland into Ukraine. Where do you think that stands? Do you think we should be expecting some positive movement from that in Ger from Germany anytime soon? Well, the conversations that I had with the uh, German foreign minister certainly give me the uh, impression that, 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 that you know, Germany is, is thinking very, very seriously about how it can increase its commitment. It has been giving armoured vehicles of uh, various types, particularly air defence armoured vehicles. Um, we've got to recognise how big a, a step change this is in German foreign policy and German uh, defence uh, policy. Um, you know, because of their history, uh, they have, uh, I think quite understandably, been uh, cautious about their defence posture uh, in Europe. This is something that I've discussed with, with Annalena uh, in the past, but they recognise that something quite fundamental has changed, and they are going through their Zeitenwende, an epoch-defining change, mm. is of real significance. Um, and, you know, we regard the commitment that we've made to um, Ukraine in terms of providing main battle tanks as being significant. Uh, I spoke to my uh, Ukrainian uh, opposite number, um, Dmitry Kaleba, uh, yesterday, and he thanked me for those donations, and we recognise, or we believe, that the provision of NATO standard um, uh, main battle tanks will be decisive in mm -hmm. this. So we encourage, we encourage uh, others to do so. And I think that reflects the point that Ben Wallace made uh, in, uh, in, in his comments. Um, because for all the reasons I've already discussed, yeah. um, the, right, the right thing to do is to give the Ukrainians what they need to bring this to a successful conclusion sooner rather than later, particularly as, I mean, you see the images overnight of those attacks on civilian infrastructure. Mm -hmm. We need this to end, and we need this to end with Ukraine um, uh, being successful, being victorious. One thing that struck me in recent days was the Ukrainian, uh, I think it was the defense minister said that Ukraine is a de facto member of NATO now. Is that a fair assessment? Well, um, I think we'll be a little bit careful. I mean, fundamentally, NATO is a, a defensive organization. It is never expanded by force or by coercion. Countries uh, choose to join NATO because they believe it's in their uh, interest uh, to do so. And as a defensive alliance, of course, we have a particular responsibility for our members. Mm -hmm. But the simple truth is that um, much of NATO's, uh, you know, m much of NATO's structure, much of NATO's thinking was in response to the, the threat of aggression originally from the Warsaw Pact. Um, uh, and, and of course, that has evolved over time. Uh, and what we're seeing is the conflict that we all had hoped to be able to deter being played out in Ukraine. Now, ultimately, NATO has been successful in ensuring that that conflict doesn't happen within the boundaries of a NATO member state. Well, in that regard, NATO has ultimately been successful as a defensive alliance for its own members. Um, but it was in response to uh, threats of aggression emanating from Moscow, really, that, 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 that NATO came into creation in the first place. Yeah. And sadly, we see that aggression from um, Moscow being played out, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in, the, in the fields and sadly in the towns and cities uh, of uh, Ukraine. So, of course, you know, NATO is committed to supporting Ukraine. Um, but our primary, you know, our primary, uh, our NATO's primary goal is, to, of course, to defend NATO uh, member states. And that's, that's, that, that is a, a significant important difference between what's going on there. But in some ways, Ukraine is being treated like a NATO member state, even though there aren't boots on the ground. Mm. Surely the NATO alliance is providing them with you know, an incredible amount of support mm -hmm. um, without which they would have failed in this war by now. So it does seem like he has a point in saying that you know, they're being treated as such. Well, look. Ukraine are, you, you know, Ukraine are friends. We have made the commitment to support them. Um, it is very clear that, I mean, this is a, this is a conflict uh, between Ukraine and Russia. It's perpetrated by Russia, being fought out in Ukraine. But this is a, a, a you know, this is, although it has, as I say, global implications and the significance 
uh, are, are currently being felt worldwide. I mean, there are, there are many, many poor countries in the global south who are struggling uh, to feed themselves because of the disruption of grain exports as a direct result of Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine. So it, it has a global impact, but it is ultimately a bilateral conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Putin would like nothing more than to imply that this is somehow you know, a test of strength between Russia and NATO, but ultimately this is um, this is Putin's aggression against Ukraine, yeah. and Ukraine are deserving of our support because they are the injured party here. They are the country uh, that uh, sees its borders violated, it sees its cities attacked, sees its you know, uh, sons and daughters um, uh, uh, being killed uh, on the battlefield and, 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 and indeed being killed thousands of miles from the line of conflict, uh, contact. Um, yeah. So they are deserving of our support, but it is a fundamentally different relationship to the relationship that we have with the NATO member state. I'm looking at the clock here. Sure. Um, we don't have very long. I want to ask you one more question on Ukraine and then try and get in a quick question on China sure. and Northern Ireland. Sure. Um, I think I would be remiss not to ask about a diplomatic solution here because you are the foreign secretary. Um, is there one in the offing right now? Uh, and do you think that... Ukraine is doing enough beyond putting out, you know, its 10-point peace plan to really push for a diplomatic solution here. Well, look, I, I mean, I'll re refer back to uh, the, the comments I made earlier. If this isn't resolved properly and fully, it's not resolved at all. Um, and, you know, a diplomatic solution, I mean, ultimately all conflicts... And, and properly and fully means a decisive well, victory on the battlefield first? Well, so properly and fully means that um, we don't end up with a, a kind of protracted stale conflict that then at some point in the future kind of you know, heats up again and turns into another kinetic battle like we're seeing at the moment. We all have an incentive for this to come to a conclusion, for peace to be re-established and for that peace to be enduring. What we've seen, what we saw with the annexation of Crimea is that Putin didn't stop. And we had hoped, I think collectively the world had hoped, that through negotiation that he would um, see the inappropriateness of his action and would go no further. Well, that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. He did go further and he attacked other parts of Ukraine. Um, and we need, to, we need to recognize that and we need to make sure that when this bout of conflict, when this current battle, when this current war stops, that it's because it has stopped properly. Otherwise, as I say, at some point in the future, um, we're just going to be having this conversation all over again. All conflicts ultimately end uh, around a negotiating table. Um, you could argue, therefore, that with, uh, with a diplomatic um, uh, element, a significant diplomatic element. element. Um, but ultimately, it needs to be done against a backdrop of um, a meaningful engagement. So when the Russians come to the negotiating table, it's got to be in good faith. It's got to be meaningful. It can't just be as a fig leaf to re-equip, re-arm, recruit or train. It has got to be because of a genuine desire to, um, uh, to have a, a resolution. At the moment, I, I'm certainly not seeing any of the indicators that, that Russia's actions are in good faith. And so they need to be pushed until they are in good faith. And that's why the military... That's why the military element at the moment has got to be the precursor to the diplomatic element. But as I say, ultimately, we want this to stop. Mm -hmm. We want this to stop. But if it's going to stop, and if that conclusion is going to be sustainable, it has to be done properly. And that, yep. and that means not, 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 not rushing at a superficial um, or an artificial end to this conflict. So quickly on China. Sure. Um, a major topic of uh, discussion and speculation, um, and I'm sure intelligence gathering, has been on what lessons China is taking from this conflict. Do you have any updated assessment on that? Uh, do you think there are specific lessons that they are, have learned you know, now that we're almost a year into the conflict that are perhaps different than what they thought at the outset? Well, look, it's, um, I'm going I'm to zoom out a bit because, uh, as I said, you know, a, lot of, a lot of people, a lot of countries will be looking at how this plays out. They will be looking at, you know, when we make commitments, do we stick to those commitments? Um, do we have that strategic endurance? Do we have that resilience? Do we have that grit? 
um, or are we going to be easily distracted? Um, and so we need to think carefully about what, message, what messages we're sending all over the world to allies, to opponents, to uh, potential, um, uh, you know, to, to potential partners, um, because you know everybody's watching this. Uh, and so we do need to be thoughtful about the messages that we send. And I think it's in our interest, in terms of the interest of global peace and security and prosperity, that the message we send out is that we do stick by our commitments and we are in it for the long term. And when we make a promise, we, you know, we, we deliver on that promise mm -hmm. and that we are, um, uh, we are not easily distracted or easily swayed. Um, and, and, and I'm sure China will be, uh, will be looking at that. As I say, so will uh, plenty of other countries around the world. So we just need to be thoughtful about the message that we're sending. So no new assessment that... Well, uh, um, you'll excuse me. My focus at the moment are, is, on, is, on the, is on the kinetic, brutal, painful conflict Got that's it. playing out okay. uh, in Ukraine. Um, I think ensuring that Ukrainians are successful in that has got to be the... Uh, at the forefront of all our of all our minds, mm -hmm. um, because of course, as I say, that is the I mean that is the place in the world now um, where a uh, kind of a level of aggression and violence and brutality on the scale that we're not used to seeing this century mm -hmm. is being played out. And we 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 got to focus on that. We have got to address that. We have a hard out in about thirty seconds, so I'm oh, going to okay. ask you one uh, yes or no question, oh, which yeah. I know are in which case the answer is yes and the or least no. favorite for diplomats, <laughs> but. Um, I just want to ask you one question on Northern Ireland. Are you confident that there will be an agreement between the EU and the UK on Northern Ireland before the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement in April? Uh, so to give you a yes and or no answer, um, look, we, we want to get this resolved. This is, a, this, is about, um, this is about making sure that a part of my country is able to be a meaningful part of my country. Um, Northern Ireland is part of the United Kingdom. It says so on the front of the tin. It's the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. I was over there recently talking to a business that can't buy products from uh, the UK mainland, can't buy products from Great Britain, yeah. and that's causing a real problem. Uh, we recognize that there are concerns that the EU have about their own internal single market, and they recognize that the UK has concerns that we want to address about the internal market and the integrity of our own country. The conversation is happening in good faith, very discreetly, um, and that discretion, I think, has helped us make real improvements, and it's because of that discretion that I'm going to I'm going to bite my tongue and not give you the yes-no answer that you desire. But we want to get this resolved as soon as, as soon as possible, get the institutions of the Good Friday Agreement back up and running um, and trade internally within the UK and with our uh, near neighbours in the European uh, uh, Union as well. Well, you clearly put a lot of work into it, and I think people are watching that closely, particularly President Biden, who has a personal vested interest in that. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. I hope it was a useful discussion. And welcome to Washington. Thank you. Thank Foreign you very Secretary. much. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks.